In this video we're going to look at differentiating exponential functions. We'll be going on to look at examples of differentiating functions that have um, exponents in them, uh, but we need to have a look first of all at what that is. Uh, we particularly want to look at one special type of function. You may know that exponential functions all have a particular uh, shape and there's in the, the graph here uh, there's uh, an example that red curve here is an exponential function uh, we know that because it goes through uh, 0 1 on the y-axis and they tend to take the form uh, f of x or y equals a to the x where a is some number so y equals 2 to the power of x y equals 3 to the power of x y equals 10 to the power of x and all these exponential functions have this rapid growth as x gets larger the y coordinates get substantially larger y equals 2 to the x remember is represents a function that doubles uh, every time x increases by 1 so 2 4 8 16 32 so it's a very large increase and that's why the, the gradients get quite steep quite quickly so we want to have a look at a particular uh, exponential function that's of interest to us in calculus. Um, the question is posed as different ways of looking at it. Here's one uh, question. Is there a function or is a value for a for which the gradient is 1 at x equals 0? Uh, that's at this point here. I'm going to put it on the graph. Um, at the point here, that's obviously the, each of the, the curves goes through it. And at the very point zero one, they have slightly different gradients. And there's one that cuts it at exactly at 45 degrees. So the gradient is one when x equals one. Sorry, when y equals one, rather. Okay. There's a couple of ways we can look at it. We can look at it graphically and we can look at it algebraically. I'm going to do both of these just to emphasize the point. So just stay with me, if you will. So first of all, we're going to look at it graphically. Uh, using Desmos, which is a wonderful graphic calculator. Um, what we have here is a red line on the graph represents a function. If you look um, at the top left, it's a bit cut off, but the, the, the function that we're looking at is y equals a to the x. And the little one at the side there tells us that uh, a has a value 1. So that's uh, basically f of x equals 1 to the x which for any value of x is just going to be 1. That's how I've got a horizontal line. That's not very interesting. What I want to do is to uh, increase uh, the value to, say, 2. So we've got y equals 2 to the power of x. That was the one I was talking to you about before. And the red function is y equals 2 to the x. There's a green function has uh, uh, appeared on the graph. Interestingly, that's the derivative value of the function at any point, the derivative, the gradient. So it's calculating the gradient at any point. And what we can see here is that when uh, the y coordinate, or when the y value is 1, the gradient of this particular curve is a bit less than 1, it's, it's about 0 0.7. Uh, so it doesn't meet that criteria. We were wanting to find out, well, for what value of a will this green curve um, also be at the point 0, 1? So if it doesn't work for a equals 2, we'll continue to increase it uh, through to a equals 3. Um, and you'll notice, if we zoom in, it's actually gone a bit uh, beyond that. So the... the the green curve is the gradient value. You'll notice that um, the gradient that now, uh, when the curve, the red curve is at one, its gradient is actually about 1.1. So we want to dial it back a little bit, and if we do that to about 2.7, you'll notice that the curve, the green curve, lies on top of the red curve. In other, in other words, the value of the gradient of the red curve is one when y equals 1, we will meet our target. So the answer to the question is, is there a value a such that the gradient of uh, the curve is 1? And the answer is, yeah, 2.7 roughly to the power x. But it's a really interesting feature here. It's a, a, 
really significant feature is that if you notice that the curve doesn't just uh, overlay the, the, the gradient and the value of the curve don't just match up at, at a, y equals 1. You notice that it, it basically matches it the whole way. So just to emphasize what that means is that when the value of the red curve is 2, the gradient is also 2. When the value of the function is 3, the gradient is also 3. In other words, we can summarize that by saying that for this particular value of a, y equals round about 2.7 to the power x, the gradient of the curve is always the same as the value of the function. So if the y value is 5, uh, the gradient is 5. Which is a really interesting and, and striking idea. So we found the answer to our question, is there a value or, um, of A such that the gradient um, is 1? And we'll have a look at the algebraic implications of this. What a way of uh, having a look at this is we'll, we looked at the fact that 2 to the x and 3 to the x um, our answers are slightly below and above what we were looking for. And what I've done here is I've used the uh, differentiation, differentiation from first principles to create a derivative for uh, the f of x equals 2 to the x. And I've used the same thing for f of x equals 3 to the x. And we're looking particularly at the point 0, 1, so we can definitely substitute x equals 0 into that. And if you notice that that then simplifies the, the two equations, so that on the left-hand side, we've got the gradient of the curve at x equals 0 is 2h minus 1 over h, the limit of, as h tends to 0 of that. And on the right-hand side, we've also got a similar-looking uh, limit function here. So when we're looking at very small values of h, we know that the gradient uh, of x equals 2 to the y equals 2 to the x is just a bit less than 1, and the 3 uh, y f of x is 3 to the x is just greater than 1. And so what this gives us is a little equation that we can actually substitute into to find that. We could do a bit of number crunching what this equation at the bottom here is we could do a little bit of iteration which means that uh, to pick a small value of h for instance h equals 0 0.01 which is small enough to be significantly small and easy enough to put in your calculator um, I would uh, if you're watching this you can stop it and you can start to then pick values of a uh, you do a to the power so if I were to pick something like 2.5, we know that 2.5 isn't far off, uh, to the power 0 0.01, subtract 1 and divide it by 0 0.01, you'll find that you get a value which is close to 1, but again, just still a little bit below. If you were to go to 2.9, you'd just be slightly above, and if you were to continue to fine-tune it, you would end up 2.7 is the best number to one decimal place. But if you wanted to try and get it more accurately, you could start to look at the second decimal place, the third decimal place. And we would end up with this number here, 2.718281281. Um, and that's just a, a, a rounding to nine decimal places. But that gives us as close a value to one as uh, we can find. Uh, for our purposes, we can make it more, but what that will do, we actually only ever think of this value really as 2.72, uh, really 2.718 uh, if we need to. And that's a special number because that is the value we describe as E, the natural exponent. And it's used, it's called a natural exponent because it's a function, it's a value that appears in so many natural um, a mathematical modeling, particularly things like population growth. Um, therefore, that's why it's kind of naturally occurring idea. So that's the introduction to 
the idea of the natural exponent e and the idea of y equals e to the power x as being a significant function. Um, what we want to do uh, is we can find the derivative of e to the power x by first principles. So if f of x is e to the power x, we want to find the derivative using uh, our formula, which says f of, well, we'll start with the, the limit as h tends to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h and f of x plus h is e to the power x plus h minus e to the x over h and we have e because we've got an addition of powers there we can split that up as a product of terms i'll write that and then you can see if you agree we know that if two terms are multiplying the indices will add together so we're just separating the e to the x plus h by putting it back into two multiplying terms. And we can take a common factor of e to the x, and that will give us e to the h minus 1 over h. Now, we've got an e to the x term here, and that term there is independent of h. So as h gets smaller, um, that's that's not going to concern us. Um, so we're really interested in uh, the idea of pulling this out. And so the limit function is really only applicable to e to the h minus 1 over h. Reminds us a bit of when we were trying to uh, work out the uh, functions y equals sine x, y equals cos x from first principles, uh, which we've got in previous examples. But what I've done is we, it's quite difficult for us to uh, comprehend the value of this algebraically, so we'll have a look at the graph of it just very quickly. So we'll have a look at this graph here. We've got the origin uh, down here. And what we do have is a red line, and that represents uh, the function y equals uh, basically e to the h minus 1 over h. I've had to use a uh, on Desmos here. And we've got a wee slider here, so at the moment h uh, has the value 1.5. And again, you'll notice a horizontal line, and as we, as a value of a decreases, then so does the uh, height of the line, so does its uh, equation effectively, and, and you can see here that it's almost down to 1. So as A increases, it goes up, and as A decreases, it goes down. When A is a half, it's almost at 1, and as we want A to get very small, forgive me, um, as A goes negative, it goes below 1, and as a gets to zero exactly, obviously it disappears. Let's go to that, and that's because, of course, there's a zero in the denominator. But as it just approaches, it's just fractionally away from a, it's heading towards one uh, from both sides. In other words, the limit as h tends to zero is that has the value one. And we can feed that in to our derivative here. The effect that we're seeing this whole thing tends towards the value 1, which means that the derivative of e to the x is, amazingly enough, e to the x. It doesn't change. And we could have predicted that just by looking at the graph, because here it is. The derivative of the function e to the x lies exactly on the function e to the x, therefore it has also the equation e to the x. So we've shown both graphically and algebraically that this result is actually true. Okay, That's a really important thing. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. 
So it sounds like it sounds quite easy. Um, but what does it mean in terms of actual differentiation? Well, let's have a look. So this is example 12. We've got a couple of examples here. First of all, let's have a look at f of x equals e to the 2x plus 1. Now, when I said that the differentiation, uh, if you differentiate any exponential function, it doesn't change, that's only if it's e to the x. And any time you have anything else, we have to think about the chain rule. So if we have the function f of x equals e to the power 2x plus 1, the derivative of that has to come from two steps. First of all, differentiate the outside function. So e to the 2x plus 1 becomes e to the power 2x plus 1. In that sense, it doesn't change. However, according to the chain rule, we must then multiply by the derivative of the inside function, which in this case is 2. Therefore, my answer is 2e to the 2x plus 1. That's my derivative. It's not too difficult. Uh, what about the second one? The uh, second one is, I'll just do it down here, f of x is equal to x cubed e to the power sine x. And we're writing that out and realizing that there's two functions there. Two different terms in x. x cubed is a particular term in x. e to the sine x is a term in x. They're multiplying together. So that looks like it would be appropriate to use the product rule. Product rule says the derivative of u dash v plus u v dash, and we shall nominate u as x cubed and v as e to the sine x. Our derivatives then, first one's straightforward enough, u dash is 3x squared v dash. So this is our, our new function, e to the power sine x. So remember, sine x is the inside function. So we, first of all, differentiate the outside term, which becomes e to the sine x. But then we multiply by the derivative of the term inside. Sine x differentiates to cos x. Therefore, the full value of v dash, or the derivative of v, is cos x e to the sine x. So we can feed that information into our product rule. So the derivative of our function is u dash v, 3x squared multiplied by e to the sine x, plus u v dash, so we've got x cubed, cos x e to the sine x. We have been looking at when we've been doing the product and quotient rule at opportunities to simplify, mainly using a common factor. And the nice thing about the exponential differentiation is there's always going to be the same term uh, in both of these parts of our solution because those chunks haven't changed at all. So as well as the x squared term, we can find we can take e to the sine x as a common factor. So in the first term, that leaves us with 3. And the second term, it leaves us with x multiplied by cos x. And there is our solution. So that should give you uh, some material to go with. Hopefully, it wasn't too long-winded and that some of that explanation made sense. But the key thing is to understand how to use the derivative of e to the x uh, in these problems. And hopefully, some of the theory behind it kind of made sense too. Okay? Good practice.